Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a Friday, which is unusual for Dark Horse Comics. Uh, normally, we stream on Wednesdays for New Comic Book Day, but thank you for joining us for this special event. Uh, I'm Carol O'Neill from Dark Horse Comics. I work in marketing communications there, but I'm very excited to introduce and welcome our special guest for today's live conversation. Um, welcome first to Cecil Castellucci and also to Devin Grayson. Um, I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves. Uh, Devin, actually, would you like to say hello first? Sure. Hi, I'm Devin. Um, I've been writing comics and graphic novels for about uh, just over 20 years now. And uh, my new book, Rewild, came out through Dark Horse earlier this year. And I'm really excited to talk about it and the environment with you guys today on Arbor Day. Well, thank you. And uh, Cecil, would you like to also say hello? Sure. Hi, my name is Cecil Castellucci and um, I am, uh, I've been writing comics for like 15 years and uh, <laughs> it's uh, the best. And um, I also write novels and uh, opera librettos uh, where I make operas that uh, use comics in them. Um, and uh, I'm very excited to talk with Devin uh, here on Arbor Day um, about uh, uh, and the climate crisis um, uh, in support of my new book, uh, Shifting Earth, which comes out very soon. I, as I said, I'm very excited to welcome both of these amazing writers here today. Um, they, both of their books are out on our Berger Books imprint, which is, of course, edited by Karen Berger, who you would probably know from all the many long years of amazing Vertigo titles, and now is with Dark Horse Publishing, also amazing uh, breakthrough content. So um, when we were, you know, getting ready to support and spread the word about Rewild, since that came out first, um, Devin had given some excellent interviews, um, kind of just discussing with reporters uh, the inspiration behind writing this story. And I noticed when we started getting the information at Dark Horse about the upcoming Shifting Earth book that there were not only similar themes, but um, Cecil, in your kind of afterward about the book, I noticed a very similar theme in like the inspiration for writing Shifting Earth as well as Rewild. So I'm just really excited to get these two together to talk about um, kind of the inspirations again behind both of these graphic novels. And then as it turns out, um, everyone is unsurprisingly probably uh, very interested in and supportive of environmental causes. So we wanted to time it to, of course, Earth Month, Earth Day, and then today being Arbor Day, um, and just kind of bring it all together and chat with you as well in the audience about um, environmental issues, climate crisis, um, this new kind of emerging genre of um, climate fiction or cli-fi. I know, Cecil, you've got some other uh, uh, interesting subgenres too, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but um, for those who are with us in the chat, you are more than welcome to join in the conversation and ask questions as we go along. Um, so please drop your questions in the chat and our moderators will be looking out for those. Um, we'll work them in as we continue through this. Um, as a quick reminder, the details of the stream are on our website, darkhorse.com. Um, both Cecil and Devin have given a bunch of suggestions of um, environmental organizations and charities they work with. So we encourage you to check those out. Um, we'll discuss that again a bit later on. And again, if you you are working on or with any organizations yourself, we'd love to hear about that as we continue. 
Um, and one final quick reminder before we dive into this some more, uh, again, Rewild is out now. You can get that at any comic shop or bookstore. Um, if you have a local comic shop near you, but you're not sure where it is, comicshoplocator.com is a really great tool to help you find more comic shops in your area. Many also offer online ordering if there isn't one super close to you, of course. And bookstores carry all Dark Horse books um, worldwide in English. So check out, you know, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. We definitely encourage you again to shop local if at all possible. Um, IndieBound.org is another great website to help you find bookstores in your area. So Rewild is out now and Shifting Earth is available for pre-order. It will be out later this year. Um, and one final reminder, again, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, please ask your questions in the chat. Just remember the chat rules. Basically, it boils down to be excellent to each other. So with all of that said, um, I will be here to kind of help guide the conversation, but I am really excited to have these two talk to one another. Um, but since we have all these viewers with us in the chat who may or may not be super familiar with your books yet, could we first tell folks a little bit about your two graphic novels? Um, and I'm going to have Devin start because Rewild is out now, if you would. So Rewild is a contemporary fable about the climate crisis. Um, it sort of borrows a lot from the genre of magic realism. And the story is about two young people in a fictional um, uh, Eastern seaboard town that find themselves challenged to save their city and by extension, the planet from um, a group of fae who or fairies who have become polluted uh, along with nature. As we've polluted nature, it's changed them and they're very angry and sort of they become the voice of nature and are very unhappy with how we've conducted ourselves. And these two people end up with the weight of this entire problem on their shoulders. And Cecil, would you likewise give a little synopsis of your, uh, your upcoming book? Yeah, um, you know, it's funny. This is the first time that I'm having to do that. So I'm like, what is, what, what do I say? <laughs> um, yeah, so Shifting Earth is a book. It uh, takes place in on our planet uh, in the near future. Um, and it's about a botanist uh, named Maeve Malay, who um, is trying to uh, find wild seeds um uh, so that, you know, we can start sort of rewilding uh, the, you know, pun intended, you know, the um, the earth, our earth to have more robust plants because, you know, the um, uh, and uh, she gets through a incident that happens. She gets um, pulled through to a parallel earth uh, where they have formed society and the structure of their planet earth is very different and they have all the kinds of seeds that we would need to rebuild our stocks over here and she is trying to figure out how to get home in order to help uh our earth but some stuff happens on the new earth the parallel earth that make her sort of have to figure some things out about what 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 makes you, what work do you do to save a place? Mm -hmm. I don't know. How is that? <laughs> no, it's, it's, I commend you because it isn't like the easiest thing to explain. I have read an advanced copy and I love it, but yeah, it, it would be difficult to um, summarize. So yeah. I think uh, you could say botanist pulled to a parallel earth and trying to get home with some seeds yeah. Yeah. and some stuff seeds. happens. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, it's really, it's a fascinating story and I'm really excited to explore it some more. We have some preview pages. Um, so this, everybody watching at home, this is going to be your very first look inside Shifting Earth, actually. Um, and we've got, of course, some beautiful sample pages and some of the special bonus material from Rewild to show also. Um, so we'll continue to kind of show you some sneak peeks as we go along and have this discussion today. Um, so we've got the kind of the basic outlines of both. Um, also, again, for the folks watching at home, we'll continue to drop links in the chat so you can go and see these books on our website and where you can find them and find a little bit more information about them. Um, so that will continue in the chat as well. Um, so these being comics, uh, you two are both the writers 
<clears throat> but we work with quite a lot of other people to put any comic together. So I'd love to talk first about um, your collaborators on these books. Um, Devin, would you like to start and talk a little bit about your partners in creativity? Sure. Um, all the art uh, in Rewild is from Jana Adamovic, um, who uh, I, I I could not love her stuff more. She brings the story so vividly to life and it's so full of uh, wonderful creatures and um, everything looks so alive and has so much purpose. And I always wanna know where every character in the story just came from and where they're going next, uh, all her little critters. Um, we met uh, in Barcelona at a comic convention and hit it off immediately. She'd been doing a bunch of work in France, um, but uh, she's from Serbia and had not done a bunch of work here in America yet. And we immediately wanted to do a project together and I'm trying to remember, we were sort of throwing things out and we got on to um, the wonderful Gnomes book um, that uh, by Will uh, Huygens that we'd both read and loved. And that reminded me of a character of mine, Poe, who is the one of the protagonists in Rewild. And we were sort of off and running and it, and it was so wonderful creating this world with her. She has a gorgeous young son who she really wants the world to be a better place for. So these issues were really important to both of us and she poured her heart and soul in the book and then Karen Berger our editor was very much the uh, our other partner in crime and she brought on uh, Sal Cipriano to do letters it's just it's a gorgeous team yes I Yana's art is so beautiful we do have some preview pages to show you some of the bonus content I mentioned which we'll kind of cycle through as we go along include some of her sketches of those critters and creatures that are so interesting and detailed. Um, so yeah, I look forward to kind of exploring that a bit more too. Um, Cecil, can you tell us a bit more about your collaborators on Rewild? Yeah. So um, I got to work. Shifting earth. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at the Rewild on the screen. <laughs> um, uh, shifting earth. Yes. Yeah, so that's my book. Uh, I got to work with uh, the fabulous Flavia Biondi. Um, who did the art uh, and she, I've never met her, um, but she lives in Italy. Um, I was going to maybe try to have a dinner with her when I was going to supposed to go to Europe, but you know, the pandemic that didn't happen. Um, and then uh, Fabiana Mascolo uh, is the one who did uh, the, the colors. And I'm so sorry. I'm totally blanking on, on our, on our letter. Um, but uh but uh, Flavia is amazing. Flavia did Ruby Falls uh, for Burger Books as well. And um, what I love about Flavia is that the, um, the she's got such emotion in the um, the characters and the way that they sort of um, the way that she directs the characters to sort of be with each other on the page. Um, and, you know, this is a complicated thing. We're building, a um, you know, a whole new world that has a whole different um, you know, way of uh, building things and, and stuff like that. And so uh, we worked really hard on the uh, world building. And I think she did such an amazing job um, with that um, to differentiate uh, the two worlds. And then when you added in um, uh, Fabiana's colors, then you have this sort of real understanding how our earth is kind of sickly <laughs> and this other earth is um, very uh, robust and um, verdant. Uh, and um, so I think between both Flavia's art and Fabiana's um colors, uh, you know, you really sort of get the stakes, um, you know, which is the best part of art. And of course, the fabulous Karen, who, you know, is just one of the best editors uh, that I've worked with um, in terms of really, you know, pushing you to make you get to the, you know, to the real core of the story. Um, and I'm ever thankful for great editors. Yeah, yeah. There he is. There's Steve Wands. That's he did letters on this book. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> I yeah. was like, it's on the tip of my tongue, and I don't have a copy of my book here. <laughs> it doesn't exist. No, that's, that is the trouble. It's not. It's not out quite yet. Uh, like I said, I've only gotten to read a, an advanced copy. Um, but yeah, Steve Wands letters a lot of our books. He's fantastic. Yeah. Um, Sal Cipriano actually also letters a lot of Karen's books specifically. I think there might be like a New York connection there, and I'll have to ask her. But uh, 
Yeah. So amazing. Shout out to Steve Wands. Yes. Major shout out to Steve Wands. Letterers are so important. Um, I always love to include them um, whenever possible on these. So thank you so much. Uh, You know, if they watch this later, hey, Steve. Hey, Sal. Um, (laughs) But yeah, so we've got amazing creative teams on both of these. Um, As you said, uh, Flavia worked on another Burger Books title earlier, Ruby Falls. Also amazing. Um, Check that out if you can. Written by Anne Nocenti. who you might know, you know, from a few other little things along the way. Uh, also, um, Yana, I'm so excited to get to know her art. Um, I, I don't know. Karen has brought in some amazing talent. So uh, I'm excited for more people to get to see these uh, European artists, especially on the page in the U.S. Um, again, welcome to folks who are joining us now. Um, please feel free to ask your questions in the chat as we go along and we'll add them into our discussion. Um so we've gone through our the basics of these books and our collaborators in creating these comics. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about your process working with the different folks on these books? Has it all been remote since they're in different locations than you? We actually uh, started before the pandemic, which is how we were able to meet each other in person. But uh, that started shortly after we began, which made the um, material of the story feel you know, that much more urgent. Um, so uh, yeah, lots of emails and DMs and going back and forth. Um, I, uh, I you know, write very complete scripts because I want to be clear about what I'm seeing, um, but I really value and expect pushback from the artist uh, to come in and sort of um, tell me what's possible and to push it further. And it's, it's so magical to see pages come to life like that. You have something in your head and you send it out and someone sends something back that's so... Um, multi-dimensional, you know, and something you can get lost in and there's surprises you didn't expect. Um, so we, uh, it was, you know, pretty standard script to, uh, she, Yana would send back these um, sketches of the pages that were very detailed and we'd sort of go over that and make sure everything was where we wanted it. And then uh, she would move forward to the finished pages and they, it, it was just, it's it's a very interesting one of the things I love about comics is that it's so collaborative and a lot of prose writing you're really there completely alone um creating a universe and so anything that isn't there is your fault everything that is there is up to you um so having someone with you on that adventure um adding new things that you weren't expecting and and bringing all this uh delight and joy and grounding everything is, is really I can't think of any other creative experience like it. And that's part of what I love about working in this medium. Wonderful. What about you, Cecil? Yeah. So, you know, um, Flavia and I have never met. Um, um, and I have to say that like, you know, uh, uh, shifting earth was, uh, is, was part of what I did during the pandemic. Um, Karen and I had had lunch, like, I want to say like, two and a half weeks before lockdown Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, just sort of casually talking. And then, uh, and then we just kept talking during the pandemic. And then this sort of came up and she, um, thought to bring, uh, Flavia on. And, um, one thing that I've been doing a lot lately with all of my comics is making Pinterests for the artists, um, so that, uh, they can have an easy understanding of what I'm trying to explain, especially when you're doing science fiction or fantasy. Um, I think, I think that it's really important to kind of have like a visual vocabulary together. And so that's a way, uh, that I can like, um, you know, uh, help the author, uh, the artist not have to do all of the heavy lifting, but then they can take that and be like, oh, okay, I get what you're saying and then kind of run with it. So, um, so especially when you're world building. And I think that Flavia, you know, took a lot of the, um, things that the, you know, parallel earth, earth to, um, you know, have in the way that they set up their society and, um, the way, the things that we need to do on our planet to uh, get there, but are not quite realized yet. And so taking some of those ideas, uh, from us and then, uh, bringing it over to that, uh, world. And I think, um, you know, so we, you know, that was a lot of our conversations was, um, you know, like, I think, uh, you know, like I said, the acting that she has on the on the page is so great and the emotional stuff and what are stories if they're not about uh, people and their, you know, uh, their emotions. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so most of the sort of little emails that we would have would be about like, 
you know, the solar, you know, arrays or like, you know, the windmills or, you know, like the things that the things like that or the wave capture machines um, uh, and stuff. But uh, so, yeah, so that's sort of the way that I collaborate and I echo everything that Devin is saying. I mean, it really is the best thing about writing comics, making comics is creating them with uh, other people because we all care about the story and everybody's bringing their best thing that they know how to do to the comic. And I equate it to when you're jamming, I used to be in a band and like when you're jamming with a bunch of musicians and everybody's got their thing that they're doing. And when it comes together, it's just beautiful. We did oh, visual wow. documentation uh, for Rewild too. And that's, I love that part of it where you're like literally pasting pictures of trees into a document. No, really I'm working, I swear. <laughs> this is for work. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> That's when you know you're doing it right. When exactly. when you find how much you enjoy it, what you what you do for work. Uh, well, that I mean that brings us right into one of my other questions. I'd love to know what you think makes comics the best medium for telling these two stories in particular. So um, I'll start. One of the things comics does so well uh, that again I can't really think of another art form um, that asks as much involvement from the reader. Um, there's because of the way we have panels and the way time works in comics, the reader is literally supplying action and creating time jumps and uh, coming up with what's happening in between the actions that we're showing. So they are helping us move the story forward and they have to be uh, very involved. And for Rewild, the entire story is really setting up to an end where we turn the narration over to the reader completely. So to have the ability in the story to have the reader working with us already and involved in the story that's unfolding really sets up beautifully the ability to then turn over um, really the role of protagonist at the end and say, these characters have done what they can do, but what are we going to do? What are you going to do? Um, and I can't think of how to have gracefully managed that in any other medium. It, it just flowed perfectly. Uh, from a comic or a graphic novel. Yeah, I mean, I always ask a story like what it wants to be since I write novels as well. And um, and uh, I think uh, Shifting Earth definitely had to be a, a comic um, because I think when you're, you know, trying to describe freak particle storms, uh, sure, you can describe that in a book and it will be interesting and riveting and um, and all of that. But there's something really visceral about seeing on the page, you know, like what Flavia does with the idea of the space time continuum and this, you know, quantum physics, like all that kind of stuff um, that I don't quite understand, but um, I'm trying to. And uh, And I think that when you see that on the page, you kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, fall into the story. Um, I, you know, echoing again, everything that, you know, Devin is saying. And the other thing I think that comics do really well, um, you know, that I've had maybe a little bit more of in other comics than here is silence, you mm -hmm. know, the ability to rest on the page. You don't get that in film. You don't get that in prose. You don't get that anywhere really, except for comics, because it's up to the reader who you're in a dance with who decides how long they want to hear there's the particle thing you know like I mean you can't like you could can describe that but I mean look you just see it and it's like that's the thing so um yeah that silence um is something that I think that uh is just you know you just cannot have it in any other art form yeah. Another thing I in your book that I loved was there were actual examples of people working and doing things. And because of the issue that we're discussing, the ability to really show action and show people working felt so important. And I really, I really loved that. Yeah. And I, I feel like the same in your book, um, you know, the, the, the obstacles that mm -hmm. we, at, you know, in our present situation have, you know, um, uh, you know, when it just seems very obvious to um, you know, make green spaces and to, you know, to build things in a, in a way that is, you know, good for cities. Sustainable. And, yeah. yeah, sustainable and thinking about those cities and, you know, new cities and the way that we need cities. Um, I think that uh, I think that you did that really uh, amazingly. I went to uh, during the pandemic, there was like a Nobel conference on climate 
exchange thing that anybody could attend. So I signed up and like went and, and it was really interesting, like listening to the lectures of like, you know, some people who are really, really thinking about like how we build, how we can rebuild the cities that we live in. And I think that was one of the, the sort of core questions um, that you have. So, um, you know, that you address so well in Rewild. Thanks. Yeah, you're, I love the side by side of like, here's where we are, here's where we could be. And that's part of what I love about the issue is that although the problem seems intractable, and it's so huge, and it's so easy to get overwhelmed, the solutions to how we get out of here really take us to utopia. I mean, you go from fossil fuels to solar sheep. Who doesn't want solar sheep? That's so cool. You know, racial profiling to racial justice. Everything that we have to do makes the world so much better. Yeah. And so to be able to, to show that in books or imagine that and see that uh, is really powerful. Yeah. And I think it is really interesting because I feel like Rewild is sort of like the step before. Right. And like mine is the step after of like, what do you do when that didn't happen? You know, because the earth that Maeve lives on, it's near future. There's clearly been some more pandemics, although they've learned to live with them. Um, you know, there, it's just like, there's just famine, storms, famines, you know, like, you know, ozone, like everything is just not very good. And, uh, but yet there's still a chance if only we could, right. you know, do these like um, these things. Sorry, the, the sun is, there's a skylight here. <laughs> I actually get the same thing here sometimes. So we might end up being twins in that in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> so we're twinsies. <laughs> um, we actually have a very relevant question from the chat, which I'd love to um, present for you both. Uh, so these both came out or are coming out as graphic novels rather than single issues. Um, do you feel that that allowed you to kind of um, spend more time with uh, just slow things down and kind of, uh, emphasize that silence you mentioned a bit more in the comic. Oh, I mean, I, I beg always Karen for like 50 more pages, you know, <laughs> like, um, so it's like, yeah, sure. I would like, you know, but there are so many, I think both of us probably, I mean, like, I mean, that's the great thing about comics too, is that you can, you can, you can pack a lot of punch into, uh, you know, like a, a shorter thing, like a four issue, five issue, six issue, you know, thing or a graphic novel. But like, yeah, if I had my druthers, I would just keep going and have like pages and pages and pages of silence, you know, Flavia draw all the trees and all the water, you know? Yeah, I loved, uh, for me, since it is really a fable at heart, uh, having it be one complete story made sense. Um, you know, fables don't tend to have chapters. Um, but yes, I, gosh, it, the thing I'm longing for are blank pages. I really wanted more blank pages between, for instance, the very end of the story and the afterward, so that there's time to sort of sit and process and take ownership of the story for the reader. And those funny little things that you don't think about when you're writing, like I can't write two blank pages in this, right? You know, I, I could have, but there wasn't room to do that. And it's amazing how much uh, space matters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I do think that um, I do love, you know, cause I mean, we've both written single issues and like, you know, stories that like, you kind of know where you're going, but like, you know, um, but you don't a hundred percent know. And that it could, even though you're ahead in your monthlies, like that yeah. things change and morph and stuff like that. And that's, you know, that's a really amazing uh, gift because you can sort of course correct as you're writing and as you discover things and, and stuff like that. But I also love um, completing a thing, you know, and really making it like, here is the story. You don't have to wait. Here's the whole thing. And, um, you know, and I think once again, like I said, the great thing with, with comics is that you can do that in a very, you can do a lot with, with a little. Yeah. For what it's worth, uh, for those watching and and for all of us here, uh, Burger Books has actually, thanks thanks in part to the pandemic, but I think it's good for all of these books due to the reasons you both just touched on. Um, all Burger Books titles are now coming out as full graphic novels versus single issues. So um, with the sort of stories that we are seeing told um, through this imprint, I think I think it's a great fit. Um, I love getting the full story in one, one sitting. Ah, yes, we do have some graphics to show you all of these other books on Burger Books right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, some amazing stories, including um, Invisible Kingdom and LaGuardia, both winning lots of awards just recently. And hey, there's Ruby Falls, which includes art by Flavia, who's also the artist on Shifting Earth. 
Um, so while we're while we're diving into the comics specifically, um, do the two of you have any particular favorite scenes or moments in your story that you'd like to kind of call out? Well, I don't think that way. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I mean, I'm always going to love a wormhole scene. <laughs> like I'm always going to, I'm always going to love, uh, I, I'm going to love a moment where, um, I'm a big science dork and like, I, you know, and so, and so for me, just like thinking about these very, very big ideas about, um, space and time is, I think really, uh, fascinating and, um, and so for me, that's just always going to be my favorite thing. I really like uh, juxtaposition. Um, we have uh, none other than uh, Titania, Queen of Fae, uh, as our narrator. And there's some scenes where she's uh, talking over other events that are happening. And I love that mix that you can do. I mean, you can do vo voiceovers in movies as well, but it's so beautiful on a comic page um, to have a voice saying one thing and you're watching action do something else and figuring out how they relate or contrast. Um, uh, those are, I, I love scenes where someone's telling a story over something else happening. Mm -hmm. I think you get some of that in both of these books. And I, I really like that as well. In Rewild, of course, we have kind of our modern world-ish and, and the juxtaposition with Titania. I love Yana's artwork with the fairies. It's amazing. It's gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> And then, I mean, even just the first few pages of Shifting Earth, we literally have kind of, you know, uh, two columns almost on a, at least a couple pages. Yeah. And I thought it was a really nice way to introduce, you know, that these are two parallel Earths. So we have these characters in two similar but very different places. Um, yeah. And yeah, so wonderful job on both counts uh, yeah, and, and illustrating and that. You're right, Devin, like, you know, like Dr. Zuzi Reed, one of my characters who's from the other Earth, like, she has like, you know, she, she's, um, she has a lot of like sort of voiceovers where other things are happening and she's sort of telling, telling the tale or telling parts of what, you know, what is sort of going on and what she's discovering. Um, and I love that. I think it is, you can't really, you can do it with film. It just doesn't land the same way. Right. Exactly. The other thing I noticed, both stories have um, dramatic interludes. There's a literal play in the middle yes. of yours and there's a little uh, dance, a song and dance in a bar in mine. Mm -hmm. um, and I love, I think just as writers, we tend to be attracted to all kinds of methods of communicating narrative and telling stories and how important that is even within the stories that we're telling stories about. Yeah. And I think that that's so very true. And I think with um, Shifting Earth, it was like, how do I explain the... You, the how this, yeah, the mythology. I think that the mythologies of the of our world, any mythology from any culture from our world, really helps to explain who we are as a people. And That's so right. I felt like that was a really quick way of um, of sort of making sure that the reader understood that this was a totally different um, like planet. I mean, yeah, even so the creation myth. Almost. Yeah. 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 I like that it had a little bit of a flavor of like a Greek tragedy too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you're all going to have to buy and read Shifting Earth when it comes out to see what we're talking about. But we are giving you some little sneak peeks uh, inside here. I also love those pages uh, with kind of the wormhole. And um, I love like the detailed backgrounds, you know, where we're seeing all of her calculations on the blackboard. Oh, um, 100%. Yeah, it's, you know, I'm, I'm here actually after this, uh, I'm here at this BAMF center and there's a, a, a you know, another group of um, people here and they're all mathematicians who study black holes. And so when I found that out, I went over to them. I was like, can I talk to you about space time? <laughs> so <laughs> this evening, I think maybe fingers crossed, I'm going to get to talk about space time with some real people. All that, right. by the way, is the absolute best thing about being a writer. Absolutely nothing is irrelevant. Anybody yep. you can talk to an interview, it's always worth it. Yep, 100%. Did you uh, get to kind of plan out those pages with Flavia or did Flavia kind of take it away with all the equations? She kind of took it away. I mean, I said I wanted equations on the board um, and, uh, um, you know, and with the, with the with the wormhole, it was just sort of like, 
when you, you know, I think Devin probably is the same way. It's like when you're doing a double page spread like that, and it's not something that's really a reality thing, you know, like you just kind of like explain a lot of different things. And um, I think maybe I gave her some Pinterest pictures of like, here's a thought, here's a thought, here's a thought. And then, um, you know, uh, they kind of go with it. I mean, one thing is that, you know, uh, uh, I did consult a physicist about, you know, what would be Clifford Johnson, Dr. Clifford Johnson, um, uh, about uh, what, you know, how could I make there be a possibility for, you know, a, a you know, wormhole or pellet. Well, he was like, well, <laughs> like, maybe if you, maybe if you did something like this, you know, you could hand wave some stuff. I was like, all right, good enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would love to kind of move us toward where these stories came from and what your inspirations were for creating them and for telling them. Um, so if, if we can transition a little bit, uh, Devin, would you like to start first and tell us uh, what was, what, what brought Rewild into being for you? Uh, there were, there were a couple different uh, stages of its uh, emergence and um, it probably the most important were the wildfires in California. Uh, I live in Northern California and they felt very close and they were a very, very dramatic uh, example of what we're moving into and what we're already indeed living with, um, with climate change. And they felt so unignorable when we were in the middle of it. We had weeks where we couldn't go outside. You know, there was so much smoke, you couldn't see the sun. It was utterly surreal. And to sort of realize that there were people just one state away going about their business as normal. Uh, it, it was just such a strange glimpse into our disconnect around those issues. And it, it made it feel very urgent to me to um, write into that space, into that crisis. Um, I do, a lot, I'm also a, a role play gamer and Poe as a character came from good old RPG. Um, and the scene in fact of her dancing in the bar uh, really happened <laughs> um, <laughs> in gaming terms. Uh, and then, um, the uh, the other thing I really wanted was to give nature a voice, and that's uh, where we why we brought Titania in. Um, I, I sort of wanted, you know, what would Gaia be saying to us right now? What what that I used the fairies to talk about the way that humans are um, imagining our relationship with nature. I think that's what we've used them for historically, and all the folklore research that I did kind of backed that up. So I wanted to give that folklore a chance to sort of speak back to us. Uh, and that happens through the narration. And Cecil, what, uh, what were the inspirations for Shifting Earth? Similar, different? Um, you know, I mean, I think climate crisis has been something that I'm sure with Devin and all of us has been on my mind since I heard about acid rain when I was in, you know, um, elementary school okay. and, um, you know, sort of, you know, stopped using hairspray in the eighties, you know? Um, uh, so it's always been on my mind and sort of, it boggles my mind that, uh, we would even not have started doing something then. Um, and I think the same, like the, you know, um, uh, I, I was interested in like trying to figure out a story where you had to figure out which world you wanted to save. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, uh, I also was really thinking a lot about those fires because, you know, same situation, like it looked like Mars on, you know, in Los Angeles. And, um, you know, I have been stranded places because of freak storms and, um, you know, the beast from the East in uh, Europe a few years ago. And, uh, so, uh, so thinking about that and then during the pandemic, I, um, I was, I started attending a lot. It was already one of my favorite things, but it's this thing called the Science Entertainment Exchange um, through the National uh, Academy of Sciences. And um, they uh, they have like a hotline for um, Hollywood folks uh, to call up and consult with a scientist. And that's um, actually the botanist that I got, Dr. Lisa DeLisso, uh, who helped me with my botany stuff. Uh, I got her through um, through that exchange, but they had lectures like every Wednesday and they had many, many lectures about the climate crisis. And um, so just listening to that and then being at home and 
you know, looking at like my butterfly and bee garden, which like I've made like a, my, my front yard is completely drought, you know, like you don't, you know, it can just bloom and without mm-hmm. any water. <laughs> and um, I mean, you know, maybe my tomatoes, but then I started, you know, scrapping uh, my, um, my, my kitchen scraps. So I would start like cultivating seeds for my tomatoes, my peppers, and then I'd grow them and eat them and, um, and things like that. And just trying to think a lot during the pandemic about how I could make my own food. So I didn't have to like worry about food. And I mean, not that I was worried I could go to the grocery store, but just thinking about that during the pandemic and thinking about um, how I could, uh, you know, sort of reduce my food waste as like something that I could, um, that I could start to, to do. So it was just like a lot of different things. And because I was scrapping these seeds, it sort of got, and listening to these science lectures, it got me down this sort of, um, rabbit hole of, um, the botanists who, uh, try to find the wild seeds for strains that are no longer sort of in the big farm sort of industries, you know, like the, the wild wheat, the one thing that grows at the side of the road at the top of a mountain that like has no DNA that's connected to any other. And that can actually help us down the line, you know, um, to diversify those, um, those genetics of those plants. So. I actually found this during my research when I was already writing, but I, I love it. And I kind of wish this was the origin story of Rewild. There's a wonderful Venn diagram by Dr. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson. She's a marine biologist and, you know, an environmental leader. And uh, so she has three circles. And one of them is uh, what you love, what brings you joy. One of them is what uh, you're good at, your skills, your, your special talents and magic. And the third is what needs doing around environmental issues in your area. And the intersection of those three circles is a very personal mission that you can take on uh, to help the environment. And you know, as I did it, I'm like, obviously Rewild was what was in the center of mine. And it was great to sort of, oh good, I'm already doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel the same with Shifting Earth because it's like something that I, you know, that I um, really care about and uh, that, um, you know, I continue to care about and um, yeah, bring, and it was so fun talking to Dr. Lisa Delisso, who that's what she does, you know? Yeah. Someone in the chat also pointed out, true, uh, that uh, putting these out as complete books rather than single issue floppies is also environmentally conscious. I will say I am not the expert on it, but I will shout out our print team. They've been working really hard also to make sure that we're um, utilizing more sustainable printing practices and printing resources and paper sources and things like that too. So um, big shout out to our print team for always, always looking for better ways to uh, produce even though we are still kind of a paper industry. Yeah, it is a little weird to be like, I'm on this environmental mission by my book. (laughs) (laughs) But we're doing our best and stories really are such an important way to reach people and um, uh, make a message, uh, take it from an intellectual place to an emotional place that's gonna engender action. And what we so need on climate change is collective action. So anything we can do, to make people feel connected personally to the cause and get them acting, I think is still very much worth it. hundred mm-hmm. percent. Right. I mean, I think that's why we both have stories in our stories, you know, is because right. stories and mythologies and fables and fa- fairy tales and all that, that's how, that's how we are able to dream and imagine new futures, you know? Yeah. And so for both of you, do you find your stories to be, you know, stories of, of hope or of possibility? Uh, like what messages do you hope people take from these books? So this is why I cleared swearing on this. So I have one, <laughs> going back to Dr. Anna Elizabeth Johnson, one of her favorite quotes from an interview I read with her was, fuck hope. Um, and I know that sounds negative, but it's just thinking of hope as something very passive and sitting around waiting for someone else to take care of things, which um, it both uh, Cecil and I have background in uh, superhero comics as well. And that's, I'm afraid very much um, a conceit of that, that someone else is gonna come and save the day. And that isn't gonna work in this crisis. This is about um, all of us coming together and doing everything that needs to be done all at once, which sounds overwhelming, but that's just a fancy way of saying collective action. 
So I'm very ambivalent on hope. I started this story from um, a place of mourning for my state as it burned down and I lost my mom in between the second and third uh, chapters. So there, even more grief came into it. But I think we need to see and acknowledge that grief and move through it so that we can keep going. Um, the situation that we're looking at can be really dark and scary and overwhelming. And we have to process all that and realize maybe reframe it from, I hope this problem gets solved to, I'm really excited about this world we could create if we do these things. And if we make the world more equitable and more sustainable, we could have this gorgeous world, some of which you can see uh, in Shifting Earth. You know, So um, Rewild is a fable, it's a warning, it's a cautionary tale. It's, it's the, you know, the voice at the edge of the woods going, don't come any further this way. Um, but, you know, at the end of that, it turns it over to now that we're not going this way, where are we going to go? And what I'd like to see is action instead of hope. Well said. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's why, like I say, um, you know, I, I heard of this term hope punk. And I think hope punk kind of sums it up for me because, you um, uh, you know, punk, I feel is like such an active kind of um, thing, you know, it's like, you can't be punk and sort of neutral, <laughs> like you're punk and like you, it's like you're doing things. And, um, and so I think that like comes from that, that same place. But yeah, absolutely. Uh, echoing what, um, what Devin says, this is not it is a time for hope. It's a, yeah, hope, but also it's like, you know, we got to get on it, like get the fuck on the fuck and like save the planet, you know? So, um, so yeah, so it's like every single, every single little thing, uh, is, you know, is helpful. And I think about it with all the things that I do, like, even when I plan travel now, you know, it's like, you know, how am I minimizing the amounts of air travel that I go while still doing things? So that means maybe I go away for a longer period of time and then take trains in between. And like, you know, like, so that that way, you know, you still get to, it's like reframing the way that you engage with the world. And, um, you know, we can still do the things that we like to do, take a bath, you know, but like, you know, to do it in a sustainable way, you know? Um, yeah. Being yeah. I talked about, sorry, go ahead. Oh, just being more mindful, I think seems yeah. to be a recurring yeah. theme. I talk about this a little in the afterword of the book, but there's sort of a process that you go through as you start to uh, look into environmental issues. And at first you're really, you know, you learn about your individual carbon footprint and you get really excited and you learn to waste less and you, you eat less meat and you start doing all these things. Then you keep going and you find out that that whole thing was a campaign by the fossil fuel industry to push the responsibility for global warming onto the individual as opposed to them for their yeah. corporate crimes. So then you get really just spawned it and you're like, why am I even doing this? But so I, I've been thinking about that a lot. And there's three really important reasons to keep doing things at an individual level. One is to model um, that behavior and to try to turn it into collective action. Um, one is to communicate when people start talking about uh, global warming and climate change, people believe in climate science more that's been demonstrated. Uh, you want to live more in um, a lot, you know, um, want to live uh, with your values moving forward in a way that makes sense. And it's also, um, you want to get more comfortable because we're going to lose some of these things. We've sort of been living like kings for all of our lives. We've really lived at the peak of being able to have everything we want at the touch of a button. That's not sustainable. It's not going to continue. So we need to start modeling new ways of doing that and getting comfortable with them as, as our future changes. Yeah. And it's like, you know, it's like, you know, eliminating the amount of meat that you eat is such a simple thing. And it, it does like collectively make a difference, you know, so right. your individual action of saying, oh, I'm only going to have meat once a week instead of like whatever, or I'm not going to have it anymore at all, whatever um, that does you know, that eventually, you know, when you talk about why, then it does sort of help or, you know, you don't need to buy new clothes all the time. You know, you can darn things, you can, you can change the, you know, change them so that, you know, they suit, uh, cut them up and re repurpose them. You know, th those are, those are little things that help do swaps with your friends of clothing. Like, um, 
all of these tiny little things that if more and more and more of us do it, it will have a slight effect and nudge us gently in a better direction. And I think that's what maybe Devin, I think, you know, we're both trying to talk about in our books is like that nudge of like thinking about it and being present and engaged with the world that we live in. And for both of you, is this, are, are these common themes throughout all of your work or are these books kind of your first, um, is this the first time that these themes have worked their way into your stories, I guess? For me, it's, I think, well, uh, I did a, a project um, called Omni that has a lot of environmental themes in it pretty recently, but it, but it's a more recent part of my work. Um, and it, all the research that I did for Rewild, I'm now obsessed and a total drag to have at dinner parties because this is all I want to talk about. So uh, although I don't think it's present in all of my earlier work, I think it will be going forward. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like it has been present in a, um, maybe subtler ways in like, um, you know, uh, my other works. Like I feel like, um, you know, Soupy Leaves Home, which is also out on Dark Horse, you know, which is about hobos in 1932 and the way that they're trying to, you know, like they're always like leave the place cleaner than you found it. And like, you know, bo- you know, clean up where you can pitch in and be helpful, be a part of the community. Like, I feel like that, um, the, their hobo ethical code sort of, um, fits in well with, uh, um, the idea of living with more presence and mindfulness. Um, you know, uh, funnily enough, uh, shade, the changing girl, uh, where, uh, which I did, um, you know, which, uh, her superpower is, uh, madness. Um, and a lot of it was sort of, uh, you know, look at what the earth is doing, look at what humans are doing to the earth, you know, and that's a part of the madness, you know, and so, um, so it was definitely stitched in there. So I think, you know, I had, you know, I think I'm constantly sort of um, put, you know, putting little science things in everything. And, and part of that is my, you know, my desire to have people believe that climate crisis is here. Mm -hmm. Well, and so both of you have given a lot of great suggestions um, and mentioned some of the organizations that you've become involved with or interested in. Um, I'm not going to make you recite all of them off the top of your head, of course, but uh, for those watching at home, we do have them listed on our website on um, the page that describes this stream, and we'll drop that link in the chat in a moment here. Um, but I wondered if, if Cecil and Devin, you could talk a little bit about you know, how you found those organizations and what your involvement is with them at this point. You want to go first, Cecil? Oh, sure. Okay. So, well, CPAWS, which is the Canadian Parks uh, and uh, uh, Wildlife um, Society, my dad was actually um, on the board of one of the, you know, one of the uh, local things. And so, you know, for uh, since his retirement, my dad has been um, a big advocate for water here in Canada. And so, uh, you know, goes and talks to politicians and goes and talks to the elders and, you know, tries to come up with them to like, you know, sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, make the government really pay attention, the Canadian government to pay attention. And so CPAWS was uh, something that I found through them and I've been um, donating to them um, sort of regularly. And then another one is the arts and climate uh, org, which is a, a, a an artist that I met as a re- at a residency, Chantal Bilodeau, um, does uh, climate change theater and basically puts together artists and scientists and um, you know does plays and arts uh, that that are around uh, you know the the um, the issue of of the climate crisis and uh, I, you know being an artist and <laughs> it's like I think it's really cool and I just want everyone to know about her work. Um, I, mine, I don't even remember all the ones I said. I'm constantly finding new ones. Giving Green is a great resource to if you're in a position to donate money to sort of find out uh, which organizations do the best things with it. But I think the key is to really find something local and something that you can personally be involved in. I'm very introverted. I'm not a joiner. I don't like groups, but you cannot do this work alone. You need people around you. You need to be reminded that other people know about it and care and are fighting with you. Uh, You need social support and they need your help. They need support. So I really advocate for looking around at what's happening around you and finding something local and starting there. Excellent advice. As I said, we have many options listed, but those of you watching at home, if you have others that you'd like to mention or shout out, please 
drop the, um, I don't know that you can drop a link in the chat, but let us know, um, shout them out, whoever you work with. Um, around here, Arbor Day is actually kind of a big deal. We have a lot of community um, groups going around and planting trees and doing other community works, um, always kind of throughout this entire week. I know it's maybe less known than Earth Day is perhaps, but I like that it seems to be growing into more of like an Earth Month situation now. Between it should be days. Earth forever. Earth, right? <laughs> should be Earth, Earth all the time. Five, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and Arbor Day is older. Trees. Yeah. Oh yeah, go ahead. It's been around since 1874. It's 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 an old venerable holiday, and and uh, shows how long we've known that that our we need trees. They're a very important part of uh, how we move through the world. That's how it started. Mm -hmm. Has and just kind of a segue into it. Um, has working on these books, you know, led you to find more environmental organizations, or has it been, you know, even more kind of grassroots, like what you were describing earlier, Cecil? Do you think that people are coming together more um, with individual efforts? Have you noticed, um, like, since the pandemic, maybe especially? I mean, I think you can't be living on planet Earth right now and not be like, whoa, something is up, you know, like I got to Google this or something, you know. So I, I think that a lot of it, um, ha I don't know that it's the pandemic so much as just sort of like where we're at, where it's like it's there's no denying it anymore. Um, I mean, I guess there are plenty of people who do, and I don't understand that, but, um, but I think that like, uh, even those people like are living on this planet and are seeing, you know, seeing the effects, um, of it. So I think that I did find one when I, I, I put, I, I had my, I put mine on a little list so that I could remember. I did do one. I found one called saveplants.org and they do exactly what the, um, the, um, uh, botanist Maeve in my book does where they that is their entire mission is to um you know sort of do that so I've I've sort of been following them um and I think they they're doing some interesting work so yeah that was what I found was the safeplants.org which seems very logical <laughs> <laughs> I find new ones every day I've, I've sort of become obsessed with finding where this community is and who's talking and you know the the poor sad frustrated scientists on Twitter and then you go you know find the optimistic um, people working in communication and sort of how do you talk to people about climate change and, and how do we change people's mind there's so much good work happening um, project drawdown is another one I discovered recently that I love um, but but really yeah do a search there any uh, anything you're interested in, trees, air, water, racial justice, all of it plays in. Um, and you can find an organization that's concentrating on that. Um, indigenous rights and land uh, stuff. There's so much good stuff happening. Um, and it really, it feels really different to get involved. It, it changes your um, your ability to sustain fight, the fight that we need to have. And going back to people not believing in it, that's actually a much smaller percentage than we're led to believe. I think it's less than 13% or something. Um, and the reason they don't believe is because there's been decades of corporate campaigns aimed at making it seem like not a problem. So communication is another huge area where um, we really need to hold the media accountable. We need to um, really uh, investigate and support environmentally forward politicians and leaders. Um, there's so much work to do. Anything you're interested in, you can you can find a way to make it matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think Devin made a really great point, um, you know, mentioning that like, you know, finding local organizations like that, you know, directly affect your community, you know, if that feels comfortable for you, or you can just, you know, give money to bigger places that will, you know, disseminate that money to um, areas that need need it. Like CPAWS will like, you know, be like, okay, you know, these animals need help in the Canadian wilderness. <laughs> you can, you can have your funds go directly to that, you know, so, uh, so that's another great way. A lot of these bigger organizations will funnel, funnel to specific things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, just to, you know, shout out some of my teammates, I, I think that you are both correct. And a lot of people are paying a lot more attention now. It's become very apparent. I think, you know, especially we're also on the West Coast. So the fires here in Oregon were a very visible sign of something is not right. Like this is not normal for here. Um, and just recently, you know, reminding folks or just informing um, all of us, Dark Horse, 
uh, let us all know, you know, kind of a recap of all of the efforts that we've been doing. So the printing um, that I mentioned, making sure that we're using more sustainable uh, paper and ink and other printing sources. Um, also the sustainable water bottles, that's been a big initiative of Mike Richardson's actually. Um, <laughs> but a lot of other things, just all sorts of recycling. All of our power is now coming through solar energy. Um, a lot of people are making a lot of different efforts in you know, their own ways in, in the things that they can kind of directly influence or that they are most interested in. And it's really exciting to see, I think. Yeah, that's great to hear. And a thing about uh, Burger Books too. So these two titles, um, as we mentioned, both uh, came to be completely separately, uh, but from kind of similar uh, inspirations perhaps, really? but chatting with Karen about this, um, you two are, these are the most recent examples, but also just coincidentally for Karen, um, there have been a lot of other books in the Burger Books imprint that have this kind of recurring theme. We have The Seeds, whose trailer you saw at the beginning of this um, by Annie Nascenti and uh, Dave Aha, and it's amazing, pick it up if you haven't, but it's kind of the post-apocalyptic version of what might happen if we don't change things. Uh, and then we also have Invisible Kingdom, um, also in another kind of futuristic setting, but I think it touches on some similar, similar kind of themes. And then LaGuardia again, like we just, we have a lot. And then post York, yeah. especially, I don't know if you've read that one, but um, literally New York floods, mm -hmm. um, climate change, very direct impact in that one. Um, so just a kind of recurring theme throughout many of these books. And it's interesting, you know, that it's found its way into all these stories. Well, Karen knows where it's at. Yep. Karen, <laughs> Karen is a trendsetter. Yeah, Karen. <laughs> Way Karen. forever. Yep. Shout out to Karen. Hope, I, I believe she is watching today. Uh, but yeah, so both of these books, as I said, are out on Burger Bo Books, which is an imprint of Dark Horse. Uh, you can find them wherever comics are sold and wherever books are sold. Uh, Rewild is out now, so you can get that today. Um, Shifting Earth will be out later this year, so it's up for pre-order now. Um, we have some links that you can find details about both on our website, which is just darkhorse.com. But again, anywhere you normally buy comics or books. Um, I'm going to put out a last call for any more audience questions if you would like to ask both Devin Grayson and Cecil Castellucci are writers who are our special guests today. Um, please drop your questions in the chat and our moderators will be looking out for them. Um, otherwise, uh, do you have any other um, thoughts like recommendations of um, websites or podcasts or anything you think that you've been um, interested in lately that people can check out for environmental causes or other things to support or just education? I know Cecil, you've mentioned a few things that like all the scientists you've been working with. Um, I don't know if there's any anything that would be like a public resource that people could check out. I mean, just the same things that I've already said, you know, like, um, uh, but, uh, you know, but I think Devin has like a great list too, like Sierra mm -hmm. Club or, I mean, I don't know, but then it's like, also like, you know what, plant a garden, you know, make your, <laughs> make your, make your areas around you, like, you know, nice for butterflies and bees to like come and hang out, you know, don't kill a spider in your house, like let it live. You know, it's just like little basic things that, uh, that you can do without listening to a podcast, but just listening to your, to your heart and to the world. But if you want to listen to a podcast, um, <laughs> How to Save a Planet on Gimlet is a great one. Um, it really, if you start at the beginning, especially and move through the whole thing, they, they feature a different uh, issue every week and go through it in a lot of detail. And it's really interesting to learn um, about all the different work that's being done and, and how to get involved with it. They end every episode with an action list, which I really appreciate. <laughs> Um, but I would assume anybody watching this on YouTube or Twitch knows how to get onto Google and look up what do I do for the climate crisis. Every major organization has a list. Um, there's so many people out there that want to get you involved. There's um, the just don't don't get sidetracked with the um, okay. I, I need to lower my personal um, footprint and then everything's done. You know, pay attention to actual organizations doing work and think in terms of collective action, and you're off and running. Agreed. And so for both of you, uh, what are some of the other projects you have coming up that you can talk about? First of all, uh, Cecil, you're in kind of a magical place that ties into this uh, theme of envir environmentalism right now. Um, just going to call that out if you want to talk about that project a little oh. bit. Oh, yeah. So I'm at... Um <laughs> 
I'm at the Banff Center for the Arts right now um, because I got a fellowship to uh, try for the Playwrights Lab here um, to try to make Soupy Leaves Home. Wait, hold on. I've got it. I've got it right here. Soupy <laughs> Leaves Home uh, into a play. Um, so that's what I've been um, that's what I've been working on um, here. And Soupy Leaves Home just came out again in the, uh, this beautiful hardcover hardcover edition. It's about hobos. Um, and then I also on Dark Horse have coming out uh, um, uh, the critical role uh, Yasha or uh, Mighty Nine Origins story, which was really amazing uh, to work on. Um, I think it's coming out in the summer. Not 100 percent certain because nothing is certain these days with the with the exact times. But um, but yeah, I'm really excited about that. It's true. It is coming. It is available for pre-order now. The Mighty Nine Origins Yasha's story. Um, I know everybody's very excited for that. I myself am among them. Soupy Leaves Home is also amazing. If you haven't read it, I recommend it. Um, I love, especially my favorite part is learning the little symbols that the hobos use uh, to communicate. Mm -hmm. uh, how about you, Devin? Is there anything that you can talk about? I know sometimes yeah. if it's not announced, we can't. <laughs> I do. I have a short story coming up in DC's Pride Anthology, um, which is coming out for June. I have a little uh, Superman story in there that I'm excited about. Uh, it was really, uh, it's, a, it's a gorgeous um, anthology and it was really fun to participate in. Um, and then Yana and I are hard at work at the next project, which is not yet announced and so is secret, but there are clues behind me if you're paying attention. <laughs> Ooh, I like that. I like that a lot. <laughs> The top shelf is Rewild. The bottom shelf is the next project. <laughs> Ooh, exciting. When I, I do see Rewild itself behind you. Yep. 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 So yeah, again, folks, uh, that is available now at your local comic shop or bookstore. Uh, and then Shifting Earth, you can pre-order at those same places. Um, it will be out later this year, uh, June, July, depending on your resource. Um, comic shops and bookstores have slightly different dates because we have different distributors, basically. Um, but that is pretty much time for today. Um, is there anything else that you two would like to um, discuss or let people know about Um I don't want to cut you off. <laughs> oh, well, I'll just say that you can find me on the internet at at Miss Cecil over at Twitter and at Cecil Seaskull um, over at Instagram. So come on over and say hi. Perfect. I'm at Gothamet on uh, Twitter and at DevonGrayson.net online. I think Excellent. I said everything. I, I just, I really want you to do something. Go do something. <laughs> Join the fight. <laughs> and it's Arbor Day. Hug a tree. Hug a tree. Be Thank nice a to tree. the trees. Yeah. I know. I'm looking forward to going out there. providing the oxygen you're breathing. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, both Devin and Cecil, for joining us today. Um, it's wonderful actually getting to chat with you. I've been looking forward to this. Um, so thank you for joining us to do this stream and just talking about all of these important issues. Thank you, Kara. Great. <laughs> thank you. So we will say farewell to our audience today. Um, thank you everyone for tuning in and joining us. The video will be available to watch on demand uh, coming up shortly if you couldn't catch the whole thing live. And we will see you, Dark Horse, uh, we'll see you back next week on Wednesday for the new comic book day rundown, back to our usual programming schedule. So have a good afternoon and thank you so much for tuning in. <laughs>